G'day folks and welcome to an on-chain update for the 16th of April. So today we're going to be talking about a topic that I've actually spent quite a bit of time studying and talking about over recent years and that is this concept of a top-heavy market. So what we're really trying to assess here and we'll explore this in a lot more detail, when we talk about a top-heavy market, just have in the back of your mind that we're talking about a Bitcoin supply that is prone to some kind of panic where a lot of people bought too many coins at too high a price and therefore the risk of a drawdown is elevated. So if we do have a top heavy market, generally speaking, these are the preconditions towards moving towards a more bearish trend and generally is what we see towards the late stage of, bear, of bull cycle. Sorry. So what we're going to cover today is how several of these on-chain metrics that we track and what the, we'll talk about the, the value days destroyed that you can see here in the slide. When several of those metrics are starting to hit extreme levels, which this one actually did, we need to really dig in and understand what's going on. Is this a signal that we really need to be concerned and worried that we may in fact have hit some kind of a cycle top um, and really break it down and understand it with a bit more detail? So we're going to look at things in terms of the major signals of profit taking. We're going to really describe what a top heavy market looks like and really explore this in some detail. And then we're going to look at some key metrics that I'm actually keeping an eye on um, just to really understand whether this is a consolidation, a correction, or something a little bit deeper. Now, just before we kick into this, something I'm really, really excited to announce is that we're actually launching a Substack. And this is really my way of, I mean, I love writing and I love talking about this data. Um, and we like to try and bring this lens of how we can use on-chain data to understand what is going on and get more people to really understand and more importantly, understand why things happen in the market. So of course, on-chain data is just a, one of many lenses. And we look at all sorts of data in terms of derivatives and market and all the rest of it. But the on-chain side is a very unique lens. And really my, my, a big takeaway from my experience over the last couple of years is that when you know why the market does something, it helps you navigate that volatility because you can kind of understand and reason about why things happen. So large moves to the upside, large moves to the downside, they aren't quite so overwhelming when you've got a bit of a roadmap for these are the things I'm paying attention to. Here's what a lot of the numbers and, and, and kind of the facts of the matter are telling us. Uh, and we can kind of prepare for those things moving forward. So as part of the Substack or our paid Substack, there'll be two weekly market updates. One will be a longer piece earlier in the week. Um, and then we'll do a second one that's a bit of a follow-up check-in. These will both be in written and video format because uh, some people like to actually read and kind of digest the ideas. Um, I also like to write, so it's something for me to kind of get my ideas out. And then the video update is more of the distillation of what we're talking about. And you'll also be able to post comments and there'll be a Q&A video. So if you have any questions throughout the week, um, do chuck them into the Substack. Um, it'll be available for paid members only for the, the posting comments. And we will follow up with a Q&A video on a, on a regular basis to really explore that idea. Now, for people who are on the free plan, um, we will still be doing part one. So the intro to those articles will still be available. You'll still be able to see what I'm looking at, some of the lay of the land. Um, likewise, with the video, we'll have a part one that will be available on Substack. Um, then our paid members will get the full analysis. Um, and in that full analysis, we're really going to go into the, the in-depth part of it, right? Trying to understand what is at least my kind of gut feel and view on things um, and trying to really interpret it as best we can just to understand some of the mechanics of what the market's doing um, and where we may you know, what we can start to prepare for moving forward. So very, very exciting for me. I'm really keen to bring this to you. I'm very much looking forward to your comments um, and uh, looking forward to seeing you there. So without further ado, let's get stuck into the analysis. So let's start with a big picture view on price performance. So here we're looking at the market since October, um, October of last year, which is really when the market started to ramp up. So in many ways, the price that you can see here is kind of our, let's call it modern era for, for want of a better term. This is the post ETF or the run up into and then post ETF environment. Now, what we're looking at here is the daily price performance. So the red and the green is obviously positive and negative daily performance. Um, and what we've got here in the blue lines is minus one, minus two, minus three standard deviation moves. And we're really looking for when do we get a bit of a character shift or a regime shift in the overall price performance. So what we've seen is that really from October all the way through to our all time high here in March, we really had net positive, right? Very, very few drawdown days getting to the two standard deviation level. You know, regular days that get down to one standard deviation, but that's very normal. Um, but for the most part, we were looking at very positive price action into the all time high. Since that point, we've had a number of fairly significant two and even three standard deviation moves to the downside. Now, over this weekend, we actually had a pretty substantial sell-off, which really is starting to continue um, over the course of this, uh, this opening week. 
And we sold off 7.6% in 24 hours. And this is because there's tensions in the Middle East. Um, and as a result, Bitcoin is the only liquid global asset that traders and investors can really express their view on uncertainties in the world. So Bitcoin kind of takes the brunt of a lot of these things because every other market is closed. So we can see here that this is actually just the latest in a string of fairly substantial sell-offs. So in a way, we have to look at this as maybe this consolidation or correction. It probably warrants a little bit more of a deeper dive because it looks it looks like a consolidation, but also it could be shaping up into something a little bit more severe. So really, let's explore this from the lens of is the market top heavy to the point where, you know, when we get to the bottom of this range, are there a lot of investors who are starting to panic? Do we have a lot of people who bought too many coins at too high a price. This is where we talk about the idea of being top heavy. So this is another metric that really caught my eye. And uh, this is what was a metric originally developed by uh, by the brilliant TXMC. Um, so this is one of his creations. And uh, he was actually the one who kind of posted about it on, uh, on Twitter and told us, um, you know, we've hit one of these levels of four. Now, this metric, as you can see, doesn't get to the level of four very often, right? And usually we're talking about either the pre run up to an all time high or the all-time high. So um, just like that previous chart, we've got this regime shift. This is another metric to say, you know what, we probably have to spend a bit of time studying this, this current market structure and just see whether we've gone a bit too far, too fast, and there's too many people who've bought too high up. Now, just note that in 2021, this actually peaked in January. A lot of on-chain metrics actually peaked in January, but we kept running into April, um, which is really when I consider bear market sentiment to have set in following that sell-off. Um, we never got even close in the uh, the second all-time high, but that's a topic for another video. Now, back here in 2017, we peaked in August. Now, this is partially driven by a lot of the coins taking the, the Bitcoin cash dividend, essentially, um, being spent and bringing those old coins back to life. Um, just to quickly frame up, by the way, what this metric is describing, it's based off coin day destruction. So in a way, it's a time and volume weighted metric, and it's looking for when lots of old coins in large volume are being spent. So in that regard, this metric actually peaked somewhere between three to four months before the actual peak. But we also see that we got a large amount of coins being spent directly into the 2017 peak. And here we are in March, 2024, and we've actually flagged very, very high value days destroyed multiple. So again, more evidence to say we really need to dig a bit further um, into this particular uh, environment. So talking about that profit taking, what we're looking at here is the binary spending indicator. Now, what that means, long-term holder supply is here in blue, and we can see that it starts to decline quite meaningfully. This is profit taking and spending during bull markets. We saw it in 2017, we saw it in 2021, and we've seen it since uh, roughly around January, pretty much all of 2024. Um, coins older than six months have been spent. Now, this binary spending indicator down the bottom is essentially looking at, it will turn red, right? These red bars are showing you when seven consecutive days have seen long-term supply declining. So a lot of spending over a sustained period of time. Now, what we can see is that we've actually had a pretty substantial amount of spending into that peak. So this really does align with the value days destroyed multiple. Likewise, here in January, lots of old coins in large volume being spent. That's essentially what we're seeing playing out in both of these metrics, providing confluence. Uh, same here in August, and then again into the December all-time high. So the big takeaway here is that there's no question, there is profit taking going on, um, and it's being driven largely by these long-term holders. Now, um, a lot of people say, well, a lot of this is GBTC, and they're absolutely correct. We did a video on this last week where we basically identified that GBTC is somewhere between 30 and 40% of this long-term holder spending that's currently going on. Nevertheless, whether it's a bankrupt estate, um, whether it's any other entity, if we're talking about 30%, a lot of those entities are still net sell side and somebody has to step in and buy those coins. So it doesn't really matter in my view whether they're bankrupt or whether they're just sellers. Um, one sold Bitcoin is one sold Bitcoin. And the proportion of people who are rotating from GBTC into the other ETFs is relatively small because we're seeing GBTC outflows consistently outpace the inflows to the other ETFs. So yes, it's a factor, but it's not a dominant factor. And as a result, I'm taking this particular metric very seriously. We are seeing sell side pressure. Um, 70 to 60% is actually just long-term holders, not GBTC. So we do have to take this relatively seriously. Now, this metric here is looking at the, this is probably one of the uh, most people are gonna be familiar with, which is MVRV. So what I've got highlighted here, let me just break down what's going on. 
in the green zones is what I call the euphoria zone. It's a, you know, all I've done is basically say we're making new all-time highs every 30 days. All I wanted to do is highlight when we're above the previous all-time high, right? So just keep it really, really simple. And in this instance, we are above the all-time high, previous all-time high. Now, MVRV is the unrealized profit multiple. So think about this, all the coins held within the Bitcoin system, what is the average amount of profit they're holding if we measure the current price relative to their acquisition price or their cost basis? So the higher it goes, the more in profit the system is. Now, as you can probably imagine, the higher that the in, that more gains people are holding, the greener their portfolio, the higher the incentive to start taking those profits. Now, the, the value days destroyed multiple peaks as we come out of the new all-time high and into the final peak. Long-term holder spending does exactly the same. It increases significantly when we break all-time highs, the euphoria zone. And that's why I call it the euphoria zone because it's a very distinct behavioral shift. People start to take profits in increasing size, in more volume, because there's an influx of new demand, right? When the market breaks through all-time high, it's pretty reliably there's new people coming in to soak up that supply. And if you've held your coins for a long time, you're probably in a pretty substantial gain. So the incentive structure is there for people to take those profits. Now, I do have a one and two standard deviation level, and these are quite nice to just help us understand the distinction. When we actually get into the euphoria zone, note here in 2017, we bumped our head against this level of 2.6. We bumped it again until we finally got through into the euphoria zone. 2020, we hit our head on this as well until we finally got into the euphoria zone, right? So MVRV can continue to run, but the higher it goes, the more incentive there is for that profit taking. Now we've bumped our head on that 2.6 level, right? We've actually traded back quite a bit down to 2.3. Um, this is positive. This is good to see, but we haven't quite hit that 3.4 level. Now, by the way, for MVRV to go to 3.4, we need to get to a price of about 96K. So it gives you a bit of a framework for if we did get one of these parabolic runs, and again, we don't know if that's coming, but if we were to get it, in order to get to the level of profit incentive, where you start to get real toppy formation, 96K is essentially where that would start to play out. So a couple of takeaways here. We bump our head on this level on a regular basis. So in many ways, Profit taking here doesn't make, you know, like it makes a lot of sense. It's within context, it makes a lot of sense for us to find pause at this point. The second thing is we've both hit our head against it and then ripped through it. We've set the 2019 and actually the, the market all time high here in 2021. Both of these found their ultimate tops um, at this 2.6 level. Um, so we've set local, but also global peaks. So as a result, it makes a lot of sense for us to encounter resistance and just have to chew through that over the course of the next couple of weeks. So something to pay attention to here, but it does make sense for that profit taking to ramp up. Um, and it does make sense for the market to just find a bit of a pause and a bit of a reset at MVRV levels of this magnitude. So thanks folks for tuning in for part one of our weekly analysis. If you enjoyed the video and you want access to the full video and the rest of our analysis, do head over to our Substack and hit subscribe. As a paying member, you'll actually get access to a second piece of analysis each week, as well as the comment section where you can ask me questions and we'll answer them in a Q&A on a regular basis. So thank you so much for all of your support. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.